This next piece that we're going to sing, Comfort, Comfort Ye My People, is a hymn that we're going to sing later in the service. And it has a little bit different rhythm, but I want you to just enjoy it. It's wonderful. Even though the words are, Comfort, Comfort, Now My People, the rhythm is very different. Dum, bum, 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 bum. Da, 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 da. Enjoy it. it. It brought to mind as I was practicing it the other day, the difference between the wording and the rhythm really brought to mind that phrase where Christ came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. And this piece really does that. So give it your good college try. I know you can do it. Join me, please. again once more.
Good morning. We have a few announcements to start the day. Um, we're glad that you're here with us in person, or if you're joining us live on Zoom, or if you're watching a few days from now, we're still glad to have you be a part of us. And we expend, extend a special welcome to our visitors. For those in here in person, please sign the pew pads at some point during the service. Drawing connections today will take place in the parlor at 1020. Pedro will lead the discussion on the sermon topic. Sermon discussion is a reboot of Talkback and looks deeper into the scriptures and the message of the day. Our, the children will be meeting in the Sunday school classrooms off of the gathering room at 1020. Please keep the family of Ruth Icovello in your prayers Ruth passed away this past Thursday, and arrangements are pending for her. Wednesday evening, Women of Faith will be meeting at 530. We'll have supper and then do a craft activity. Friday evening, the cribbage group will meet at 7. Anybody's welcome, and I believe that even if you don't know how to play cribbage, they'll teach you. Um, and then at this point, I'd like to ask Sue Baker from the serving team to come forward to talk to us about the angel tree. Good morning. Our angel tree present, presents will soon be ready for delivery to Head Start so they can be distributed to the eagerly awaiting families. This year we have 52 kids and one parent as recipients. The response from our congregation has been heartwarming and just this morning we've signed up the last two names that were remaining on the list. So thank you very much. So now the serving team needs more help in getting organized for the bagging of the gifts and the big delivery day to head start on Monday, December 18th. Sign-up sheets are available in the narthex at the Welcome Center, and there's three sign-up sheets, and they have um, the angel tree, and then you can sign up for the 16th, the 17th, or the 18th, and it'll tell you on each of the sheets um, what the activity is. So we need help to move the gifts into the fellowship hall. On Saturday, December 16th, we'll set up and label the loading tables and begin the check-in to make sure we have all the gifts then place them in their sturdy labeled black bags. On Sunday the 17th, we will finish that process and bless the bags with our love and thankfulness. On Monday, December 18th, we will meet at 9 a.m. at church, load up and deliver to Head Start, which is truly a joyful time. We are thankful for our blessings, and one of them is the joy of sharing with Head Start children. Then one more thing I would like to share is Starting next Sunday, um, you can bring in hat gloves and mittens, and then they will. There will be baskets by the angel tree, and if you want to just set those in the baskets, and we will start collecting those, and we will be taking some of those to um, loaves and fishes when we serve in January. So thank you. Thank you, Sue. And now, if Kim Bratz could come forward. She has some really great news for us. Good morning. So I am Kim Bratz. I am the chairperson of the PNC, the Pastoral Nominating Committee. And I just want to tell you a little bit about our process for today. So um, following worship today, we will be um, holding a congregational meeting um, to elect our next pastor. Um, I want to um, uh, thank the PNC, um, which includes uh, Dan Baker, Bonnie Hughes, and Mike Warrenches um, for all their work um, over the last, uh, well, I guess since early February. Um, it's been a really amazing process. Uh, we're very grateful to the, uh, for the trust that the congregation has also uh, placed in us to find our next pastor. And we truly believe that the Holy Spirit has led us all to be together today. So we'll have our congregational meeting following the worship service. Um, following the congregational meeting, there'll be a time uh, for fellowship uh, with coffee hour, 
Growing Connections and Sunday School. And then we will um, be having a potluck uh, starting at 11.15. So we invite everyone to stay. You do not need to bring something uh, to, in order to stay for the potluck. There'll be plenty of food. So we just invite you uh, to stay and join us in this time of fellowship. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce um, Reverend uh, Dr. Craig Alwyn. Um, Reverend Alwyn grew up on a small family farm in southern Wisconsin and started his post-secondary education with an associate degree in automotive technology from Madison Area Technical College. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in ministry from Central Christian College in McPherson, uh, Kansas in 1994, which also included a wonderful opportunity to study at the Institute of the Holy Land um, Studies, which is now Jerusalem University College. Reverend Alwyn received a Master of Divinity in 2006 and a Doctor of Ministry in 2023, both from the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary. The focus of his Doctor of Ministry program was congregational revitalization, the pastor as a leader in a, con in a changing context, and his dissertation was becoming a local theologian. Uh, Reverend Alwyn has been in ministry for uh, about 30 years. He has spent more than a decade service, service, uh, serving with various youth uh, and camp ministry settings. And for the last 17 years, he has served as an ordained ministry minister of the word and sacrament. Uh, Reverend Alwyn has been married for 25 years to Chris, and they have three wonderful children, James, Catherine, and Daniel. Uh, again, we are grateful to God for the journey that has led Reverend Alwyn uh, here with us, and let's uh, provide a warm welcome to him and his family. Now, please stand if you are able for the call of confession. Wilderness living calls us to seek God in the voice that cries out. Valleys will be lifted up and mountains will be made low. To seek God in the sound of the one who speaks of peace. The day of the Lord is coming. To seek God in the loud noise that foretells what will be made new. In the wilderness, let us listen only for God's voice and let us worship God. Let's continue now with our prayer of confession. God of love and kindness. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's do the advent calendar. candle. <laughs> okay, where's our family? Yeah.
We light this candle in hope. We light this candle in peace. Hear God's promise of peace from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hands on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. Let us pray. Faithful God, you are the work to restore all, all of creation in its intended harmony. Give us your shalom that we may be reconciled to all our enemies in the peace that passes all understanding through Christ Jesus our Lord. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come.
Okay, sorry about that. When I was working with Pastor Ken on the um, congregational study, we were giving reports. He said, always take and put all your notes just on one side so you don't have to flip. I guess that would be why I flipped too soon. So let's try the call to confession again. Wilderness living calls us to seek God in the voice that cries out. Valleys will be lifted up and mountains will be made low. To seek God in the sound of the one who speaks of peace, the day of the Lord is coming. To seek God, God in the loud noise that foretells what will be made new. The wilderness, let us listen only for God's voice. Let us worship God. Let's continue now with our prayer of confession. God of love and kindness, you have promised to renew our lives, to be with us in a new heaven and a new earth, a realm where steadfast love and faithfulness embrace forever. We are afraid of your promise coming. We cling to rules we understand, the rules of privilege and power. We are afraid of a world of true justice and peace, afraid that you will change the way things have always been. As we wait for you to live among us, we confess our unwillingness to see that you have always been here. Now, please take a few moments for silent confession. Hear these words, the assurance of pardon. In God's love and mercy, we are given each new day for the healing of the world. In Christ, in the name of Christ, you are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with those around. First reading today comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has saved her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cry... A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. 
Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The second reading also comes from the Old Testament, Book of Psalms, number 85, and we're going to read this responsively, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 8 through 13. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the inequities of your people, and you pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and we may have path for his sake. Our gospel reading prescribed by the Revised Common Lectionary for today comes from Mark's Gospel. In this second year of the lectionary, year B, we'll be going through Mark's Gospel. And today we begin with the opening words of the Gospel. Listen for the word of the Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
I'd like to invite the children to come forward. So last week, I brought my fancy box, and I had something inside. Does anybody remember what I had inside? I had some candies inside, didn't I? And what did I make you do with the candy? Wait. I made you wait, didn't I? Yeah. Because we were talking about Advent being a time of waiting, and we talked about our lighting of our first candle. Does anybody remember what the first candle, the name of the first candle was? Hope, it was hope. And we were remembering the hope that we have in Jesus, not just when he came as a baby, but when he was resurrected again. And then today we have a new candle. Does anybody know what that new candle is? Peace. So I need to, it is right there again. So I'm gonna put my peace candle in. And how many candles do we have up there again? How many, Lincoln? I have two right here. And how many do you see over there? We have five. We have five. We have four that are colored. The next one's going to be pink. Remember, I'm not going to tell you. you got to tune in next week to find out what the name of that one is. And then there's one more. This one we're going to light on Christmas Eve morning. It's got its own special name, too. And then the, the, the candle in the middle, does anybody remember what that candle is? We will light that on Christmas Eve night. Does anybody remember? It's the Christ candle. So each one of these is a very important candle. And we do very important things each week to remember. And we need to wait. Right? It takes a long time. When... When we think about waiting, sometimes we think about how long a TV show is, that's how long you have to wait, how many times you have to sleep before the next thing happens. I haven't figured out how many times we have to sleep until we light this candle, but I'm sure it's a lot. So waiting is really hard. We wait for all sorts of things. We talked about how we wait for being in line at school or raising your hand to answer a question. Maybe you wait for your birthday, it takes a long time, or waiting for dinner when you're super hungry. When, when you turn seven, it's, it's a long ways away, isn't it? When you're seven, your turtle will be six. And that's going to take a long time because your birthday isn't for a while, right? So we have to wait and we can make choices. You know, we don't make choices about the things we have to wait for, but we make choices about what we do while we're waiting, right? We do. So you have a choice in how you wait. And what should we be doing during this time of waiting? Well, one of the things, did you see we have decorations everywhere now? I started decorating my house. You can see the picture up there. I, I put that on the shelf at my house. And so we've been decorating. We start decorating. And you know what happens then? Sometimes we think about all the decorations, and we don't think about what we're supposed to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the coming of Jesus. Jesus is a baby. And Jesus is coming again. God's love is there for us all the time. And sometimes we get so busy doing all these other things that we forget about the most important thing. And that's preparing our hearts. Getting our hearts ready for God. So while you're looking, I, I had you challenged last week while you're waiting that every time you have to wait to take a deep breath in, breathe in the Holy Spirit, and look around and find God at work. And remember, if you can't find God at work right now, maybe that's a, that's a job for you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe you need to be showing God's love to someone right then. Well, this week, as you're looking at the lights, and as you're looking at all those things, as you're looking at the beautiful decorations around, I want you to remember and think about what's really important, getting your heart ready, to always make sure that you're sharing God's love with others.
So let's prepare our heart right now. Are you ready? Let's take a little time and let's say a prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the love that you give to us each and every day. We thank you for the love that you uh, give to us through other people. We thank you for the love that you give to us through the things that we have, all of the things that you've created. We thank you for a warm place to live and food to eat, clothes to wear, school to go to. We know that we have so many blessings and we sometimes forget about what's truly important. We ask that you would help us to share your love with everyone that we meet. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, the season of Advent, the season that we are in right now, it's a season, it's a time of anticipation. As Christians, our primary focus, as Jennifer just said, is on the return of Christ. And it's the return of Christ when all things will be made new. Everything will be recreated. It will be made right. And we anticipate Christ coming again by celebrating the birth of Christ and anticipating that celebration. So Advent is a time of new beginnings, a time of seeing things new, a time that's bursting with new life, a time bursting with new opportunities. Sometimes though, as Jennifer just mentioned, we get wrapped up in those traditions, those different things that we are doing and we forget about what is most important. And Advent is also a time of waiting. Like watching a garden full of flower bulbs that were planted in the, full, in the fall, we are waiting. We're waiting for these new opportunities to finally emerge. A good gardener doesn't just sit back and do absolutely nothing over the winter months. They don't simply wait, twiddling their thumbs, doing nothing. A good gardener makes the most of that time by preparing, preparing for when those are going to burst forth, preparing their tools, preparing fertilizers, preparing themselves to learn more about whatever those different flowers might be, how they're going to care for them, what they might be able to do with them to be able to share those with other people. Few among us are good gardeners. Most of us plant the bulbs and we really don't think about them until the spring and they pop up and we're like, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot we planted those. Isn't that amazing? Most of us get so busy in our life. We have so many other things that are demanding our attention that we forget all about them. They're something secondary in our life. Sort of like Advent. It's a strange and mysterious season. It's a time of tension as well. It's a time that's bursting with new life and yet a time of stillness and waiting for that new life to come. The Apostle Paul would say the already but not yet. It's a tension of anticipating new life becoming more and more foreign amidst our instantaneous modern life. That waiting is so foreign to us in our life, most times, we sense a problem. We see something, and we say, okay, we want this fixed. And we want it fixed yesterday. Is that possible? Doesn't matter if we schedule a doctor's appointment or an oil change appointment. Uh, well, that'll be three months from now. But I need that oil change now. I want to know what's going on with whatever that physical ailment might be now. We don't want to wait. And we get frustrated with that. I'm guessing there's a few people here who have been a little frustrated, maybe felt a little bit lost over the past two years of waiting. Seems like a long two years of anticipating. I'm sure there's been more than enough moments of tension, uncertainty, hopeful anticipation met with, again, that reality of 
waiting. Really? Kim, what's going on? Can you speed this process? Come on. I'm sure those thoughts, those comments have been a part of the journey over the last couple of years. And this tension, this is part of our life. It's part of who we are, being created in God's image. This tension is woven throughout the whole narrative of the biblical testimony. This recurring Advent tension is part and parcel of being the church, the body of Christ. Now, our gospel text today from Mark tells of this anticipatory tension. We read about John the Baptist who is anticipating the one who's coming after him. And we read about John through the prophet Isaiah. Both of these texts are filled with unexpected beginnings. Both of these texts are filled with anticipation that's rooted in waiting. As I read this text, I thought, what is it about this prophet? What is it about John that drew everyone from all of Judea and all of Jerusalem out into that wilderness area to be baptized? Not just to be baptized, but to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and their lives and they wanted God to forgive their sins. What is it about the wilderness connections to the prophet Isaiah, to John the Baptist, that has importance and meaning in our life today? This is far from a wilderness situation geographically, but these are relevant questions for our lives today. New beginnings are not often as we expect. It's only when we pause and we step back and we reflect for a few moments. Then we become aware of all the unexpected events that happened earlier that precipitated life as we know it now in both positive and negative ways. To take a look at this beautiful structure and to see some of the items that came from the old church and to think back of the fire to think of the many lives that have been a part of this congregation over many, many years. We need to pause and think back. I believe I saw something next week, be celebrating 50 year anniversary of people who've been members of the church. We need to do those things and to pause and to think back. That is part of that Advent tension. We know those situations in our daily lives, our everyday lives. I can remember when our first child was about to be born, should have already been born. We would cross over that nine month mark and Chris, maybe a little bit more than me, was anticipating the birth of our first child. And, you know, there are certain things, you know, you can get out and walk, the doctor said, you can move around and that might speed up the process. Might not. We both love mowing the lawn, so you know we kind of rock, paper, scissors over to you know different ways of figuring out who gets to mow the lawn. We're kind of weird in that way, but we enjoy it. So she wanted to go out and mow the lawn with the hopes that maybe this will get things going. Okay, I went out there, and so I was standing there, I think probably drinking a cup of coffee or something, and just kind of standing there in the driveway and Retired neighbor from across the street comes over. And, <laughs> How's it going? What? Why is your wife mowing the lawn? Why, why aren't you mowing the lawn? And so I explained to him the situation. Well, you see, the due date was about three days ago, and she really wants to be mowing the lawn right now. Would, would you like to tell her that I should mow the lawn? It's like, <laughs> no. Nah. I, I see what, okay. There are those times we need to simply wait, but not just wait. We are waiting, doing things. We need to remember that the process over the last two years has involved many, many things, many things that aren't shared and aren't broadcast and communicated with everyone, and yet there is much that goes on. These Great new beginnings that happen in life are often precipitated by something unexpected. Great scientific discoveries, maybe such as 
gravity, electricity, splitting atoms, penicillin, these have often come as surprises, breakthrough moments. And we look at these new discoveries through the frame of gaining some greater understanding of how nature is structured and organized and how we can make life better. We celebrate these discoveries because through them we gain more understanding. We gain more control. We like having control. We like being able to manage things and know what is going to happen. We like to make our life better. The question I want us to wrestle with today, what might it be like for us to experience a great discovery that gives us more understanding into the spiritual realm? Greater understanding that we are not in control, that it's not about you or I. Greater understanding about God being in control and who God is, specifically who is God in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who became human. That is the mystery of Advent that we are to experience in our lives. The Old Testament reading, Isaiah 40, is a poem, and it opens the second book of Isaiah. The first book of Isaiah tells of all the things that the people did wrong. The second book talks about hope of returning, returning back to Jerusalem. You see, they've been in exile. Babylon has come in, taken over, destroyed Jerusalem, and they have been exiled to Babylon. They've been exiled because they look at themselves, put their own needs ahead of the needs of others. And this second book of Isaiah, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, begins to tell of this hope. So this poem tells of God's offering comfort to God's people who don't really deserve it. It begins with God proclaiming, basically tell my people, that I will comfort them. The response, really? Really, God? You want me to tell people that you're going to comfort them? Why should I tell this group of people they're so fickle? They're fickle as the grass that withers and fades. They don't deserve your comfort, God. Why should I go and tell them? They won't listen anyway. They don't deserve to hear this message. To which God or this voice responds, because it's not about them. It never has been about them. It never will be about them. It's about God. God providing comfort and peace. The gospel writers use Isaiah 40 to convey a connection between what in their time was a similar instance of this completely unexpected, unearned, undeserved divine compassion. The entrance of Jesus Christ into the world. The text reminds us that the unexpected can still happen and does still happen. God still sends comfort into our short, frail lives. New beginnings await us all the time. New life is here now. God is here. God has come to dwell among us, to tabernacle among us. And we are to be God's people. We need to gain a much more robust understanding of the incarnation of Christ and seeing God in the everyday, in the ordinary. So as we journey through this season of Advent, as we experience more and more of the fullness, the anticipation of all that God is doing, it is important for us to understand where it is that we come from. And that concept of wilderness that's in both of our texts. Now there's many different ways we might think of wilderness. I'd like to offer two possibilities that a couple of commentators brought up. One is a wilderness that's not really meant 
originally for human habitation. It's something that needs to be conquered and made something that is good for us. And the other is that wilderness is that place of struggle, both problematic struggles and promising struggles. What is the difference? It's not about us conquering and making it better for us. It's about experiencing how we are to be made better in the midst of it. Courtney Buggs references some writings by Dolores Williams when she says, for African-American slaves, the wilderness did not bear the negative connotations that mainline white pioneer culture assigned to it. The wilderness was a positive place, conducive to uplifting the spirit and strengthening religious life. The symbolic wilderness that Williams describes enables us to hear the sounds of ancestors who navigated difficult terrain, preparing the way for generations to come, forerunners. Perhaps understanding wilderness as a space where faith is cultivated and strengthened illuminates why all the people of Jerusalem went out to John in the wilderness. They were drawn to a man on the margins with a message. These words from 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, help us to understand the voice that's commanding that we prepare a way in the desert, in the wilderness. But that way is not our way. It is the Lord's way. And that is good news as we continue to struggle in our life. Because it's in our wilderness moments of life that we are forced to pay a little bit more attention. We often pay greater attention when we're in those moments just so that we can get out of that wilderness. That is the purpose of paying a little more attention, but we seldom make the time afterwards to pause and to reflect. How might that be applied to the rest of my life? What might I learn from that wilderness struggle? When I used to do youth ministry, I'd lead trips up to the Boundary Waters. I don't think there was a single trip that I went on that something didn't go sideways in the midst of the trip. We had to expect the unexpected. More than once, I can remember specific instances of needing to stop in the midst of the wilderness with three canoes, about a half dozen backpacks, and that's it. And to look at a group of youth and say, okay, now what? One of my most memorable moments is a trip where one of the youth who was in high school, six foot nine, 320 pounds, offensive lineman on the football team, came along on the trip and oh, we were all so glad to have him along. He was carrying everything. That was the easiest trip wandering through the wilderness and he loved carrying canoe, two or three backpacks all at once. No more double portaging, we made good time. Until that one day, a couple of days from the end, he missed one step, twisted his ankle, and he was down, laying there in the water. We had to regroup and figure out, now that he can't carry all of this weight, how are we going to divide this up amongst the rest of us? As a leader, I could have attempted to carry as much as he did, but <laughs> that would not have worked. We figured out how we were gonna make it back out and make the most of that. And as we got out and we sat there after getting showers done and getting cleaned up and having some pizza at the local pizza hut in Ely, Minnesota, we kind of debriefed and said, now, what are those situations in our life where maybe we're all taking on too much? How do we help one another out in our everyday life? What can we do in our youth group 
What can we do in our church, in the schools, in the community, in our everyday life? How is this going to change us? What have we learned from it? That is what we need to do each and every day of our life. Right now, we are all in the midst of a great wilderness waiting. Our society is in a wilderness waiting. We are in many ways lost and alone in this modern wilderness. There are so many struggles. There are so many challenges that are screaming for our attention. The pews aren't as full as they used to be. The offering plates aren't as full as they used to be. People don't this, that. We need to this, that. And we point out all of these problems and we try to fix them. And we want a quick fix. We want to fix yesterday, right? We want the mountains to be made level. We want the paths to be made straight. But that, that is not the way of our life with God. That is not a biblical message. That is the message of what is to come, what we have to look forward to. But that is also the message of how working together as the body of Christ, together, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to make that path a little bit straighter. But in the midst of the already, not yet, we are people of tension and anticipation and mystery. We are people of God. And we need to claim that. We are not just the God of a few key verses taken out of context in the New Testament. We're not just the God of the New Testament. We're not people of, we are people of God of the entire narrative of Scripture. The God who was, the God who is, the God who is to come. The God who, as is written in the Christ hymn, emptied himself, humbled himself, became obedient even to the point of death on a cross. The God of mystery, the God of hope, the God of peace. I want to share the next two Sundays, the God of two other important topics. That is the God that we serve. We are God's people. The Gospel of Mark is all about beginnings. That is the title. That is the start of it. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Mark's gospel ends a little bit abruptly, reminding us that that is not the end. No matter what happens today with the vote, it may be a new beginning. I pray it is. But whatever that may be, if it is a new beginning, it is a new beginning of being the body of Christ together. It is a time of learning what it means to be God's people and accept that comfort that God gives to us, that forgiveness as we turn and we seek God with repentant hearts. May we be people who are all about that wilderness waiting. And may our active lives of wilderness waiting create enough curiosity in the people around us that they too want to break through those spiritual barriers and to say, what is different in your life? What is it that you have experienced? I want that. To which Inside, we might be saying, okay, you don't deserve to hear this, but comfort, comfort my people, says God. May we be people of wilderness waiting, actively anticipating the return of Christ as we celebrate Christ's presence with us each and every day, in the everyday and the ordinary. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen, amen. I invite you to 
stand, I believe, is the appropriate thing, correct, for our sung response. Number 87, Comfort, Comfort, Now My People. This is a hymn that is basically rephrasing Isaiah chapter 40. be seated. I invite the ushers to come forward to gather God's tithes and our offering, and may we place our very selves to be used, place ourselves in Christ's hands that we might be molded and shaped into the people that God wants us to be.
Almighty God, we ask that you accept this gift of thanks that we bring before you. May you multiply this, bless this, multiply us and bless us that we may be your people here, living out your kingdom on earth. Amen. may be seated as we turn to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, as we gather together today in this place, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the air that we breathe. We give you thanks for the opportunity to gather together in peace. We give you thanks for all those who have gone before us, for those examples of people who have followed after you. We thank you for those examples of those who have gone before us, who have strayed away from you, who have sought after their own selfish desires. Lord, in all things, we give you thanks for the examples, the assurance, the promise that you draw us all back together. As we gather together, Lord, we do remember those who are struggling in life. We lift up to you those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, especially the stay family of Ruth. We lift up to you those who continue their battle against many different health conditions. We lift up to you those who are struggling with relationships. We lift up to you those who are struggling with financial struggles. We lift up to you those who feel they have no struggles and who all too often tend to rely on their own assurance. Lord, remind us that it is not about us, but it is about you. Remind us that all that we have, all that we do is entrusted to us. Lord, help us to make the most of what we have, to make the most of our own lives, to make the most of opportunities to gather together, to hear your word, to share the stories of where we have encountered you in our life. Lord, help us to slow down, to pause, and to find true peace as we wait. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts that we might see the many ways in the everyday and ordinary moments of our life where you are present among us where you are at work in us, through us, among us, and especially where you are at work in spite of us. Lord, may your people continue to be gathered back together to share these amazing stories, to be encouraged, and to simply sit, to be still, and to know that you are God. Lord, as we still our lives, we pray for the lives of so many around the world that are caught up in the midst of war and conflict and abuse. And we ask, Lord, that your peace would be granted to those situations. Continue to give us patience as we wait for your return. But let us actively wait. This and all the prayers of our hearts, we lift up to you, praying together in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand. Reminder, we will be shifting right into a congregational meeting in a few moments. So as we close out our time together of worship, receive this blessing. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you wherever he may lead you. May he guide you through the wilderness. May he guide you through the storm, bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.